Well, hello everyone, and welcome back to Adrian's Digital Basement 2. On today's video, we're doing a super mini mail call. It's been a little while and, um, well, I didn't even get through the packages I had last time. And of course there's more. I'm sitting next to me. I just grabbed some random ones from the pile. Let's get to opening them. All right, so the first package here comes from Brett in Pace, Florida. Hi to all my Florida viewers. This one does say mail call on it, so it wasn't something that I ordered and I uh, forgot to open. Looks like we have a letter here and some smaller packages. Let's dig in. All righty, so let's see what the letter says. Hi, Adrian. I'm going to be moving to a new house soon. And, I, and as I went through all my retro gear, I found a few bits and pieces I thought you might be able to make use of. A sealed box of five and a quarter inch floppy disks. I bought these with the intention of testing a 1541 floppy drive that I picked up with a lot of broken 64s, but the 1541 turned out to be completely dead. That's a shame. I don't have time to fix the 1541, and it's currently beyond my skills to repair. I've since sold off 1541 for parts. That's great, but thought you might be able to use the disc. Yes, absolutely. We also have one C64 to C128 power adapter. I picked this up while thinking that I might add a C128 to my collection and use my modern C64 power supply with it, but I changed my mind about getting a 128 <laughs> and hope you can make use of the adapter. Also a box of a few miscellaneous 74 LS chips. These were mostly chips that I removed from scrap C16 motherboards to teach myself desoldering technique. And I tried to test these in my TL866 Plus and they all seemed to pass. Maybe your retro chip tester pro can give a definitive answer and hope you can make use of them in your repair. Keep up the good work and the entertaining and educational videos. Thank you very much, Brett. All right, so let's take a look here. I'll just I'll move that box out of the way. So a still sealed box of floppy disks. Pretty cool, verbatim. Now, um, while the sealed nature of it is kind of cool, I'm, I am gonna open this up and I'm gonna do that because I really like to check for mold. You just, you don't really know, even if it's in shrink wrap, if mold has formed on the discs and if they have, if, well, if mold has formed, you do not want to put those in your disc drive. It will definitely shed uh, that mold onto your heads, cause all sorts of issues. It's also possible that if the disc weren't stored properly, that the magnetic media can also shed into your disk drive. And while well, that can cause issues as well, because it very quickly gunks up the read write heads on the drive. Now the condition of these um, looks nice. They look good. I mean, there's no mold or anything on the labels and let's zoom in so you get a close look at this here. You just sort of spin the disk around and look for any splotches or any other marks or anything like that. And that looks really good. And to be honest, because these were all stored together in the same box, I'm gonna guess that these are all in really good shape. Yeah, that looks good as well. Cool. So what I typically do with discs that I haven't tested yet, like these, is I have this box here, and this is kind of like my, my incoming disc box. So anytime people give me any discs yet, uh, three and a half inch or five and a quarter inch discs, I stick them in here and this sort of sits over there next to my lab PC. So I'll just stick these in there or it's not the lab PC I'm recording here. It's my, what's that? Pentium 200 machine down there. The one that has all the disk drives in it. I stick it next to that. And then when I have a little extra time, I will set up that machine to just start formatting, bulk formatting disks. So 360K disks like this, I'll just run format Q and I'll just stick one disk in after another, make sure they format properly. Once they do, I take them out of this box and then I have other disk boxes that are just filled with formatted known good disks. Because honestly, my biggest thing is that when you're going to use a disk, say you need a, you're working on a PC or a computer or whatever, you need a floppy disk. I don't want to have to go and grab one of these not knowing if they work or not. So that's why I will go into my other disk boxes of known good formatted disks. Uh, same goes for these 1.4 meg disks. Actually, this is not a, that's not, shouldn't be in there. That's not a blank. Uh, I have 720s in here as well. So yeah, like this is sort of my incoming pile of disks to format. And I don't use these labels anymore because it seems like the adhesive on these always fails. Although this, these seem like in good shape. So I'm gonna stick that back there. And then for the box itself, um, I have a little collection of these boxes, which I keep on a shelf in the other room. And yeah, this one, if I don't have another verbatim disc box or if this one is in better shape than the other one I have, then I will keep this. Otherwise these discs will uh, yeah, go into my little two format pile here. Oh, look at this. I decided I didn't want to keep Money Mentor and I was going to format this disc. <laughs> Anyhow, 
Okay, so next up is this little adapter that Brett sent in. And you know, these are very, very useful. So the Commodore 64 and the 128, while the physical connector is different on the power supply, it's actually the same voltages. It's nine volts AC and five volts DC. Now you wouldn't wanna just use a standard death brick, the bricks that kill 64s on a 128. Those really can't supply enough current, I think on the five volt rail to the motherboard on the 128. On the other hand, a 128 power supply is actually fully capable of powering a 64, and it's actually a quite a reliable, safe to use power supply. So what I actually do is um, this right here is a C128 power supply, and I've actually cut off the original cable here, or just the end of it, that plugged into the C128, because originally uh, C128 would use this square type connector. I added a regular DIN here that goes into a 64, and then what I did is that little piece of the cable that I cut off, which I, I saved about, I don't know, six inches or so, I then installed a female DIN jack, just like this little adapter, and then the original Commodore C128 jack is on the end. And that allows me to use this pretty good safe brick here, even though it's really quite large, on both 64s and 128s. So if you have one of these power supplies and you have C64s you use as well and 128s, I highly recommend doing this mod. It's pretty simple. You just got to buy a couple of DINs, solder them all up together. And then when you connect these up together, like so, then you now have a power supply that again can power the C128. And then you just pull this off and now it's good for the 64. I just went into my little box of cables and here's the original pigtail, the one I made using what I cut off this cable. And then this is the one that Brett sent in. So it's useful to have two because occasionally I'll misplace this. <laughs> Not to mention I have the power supply that I made myself that I use for powering up 64s. And I also use it for powering up 128 because inside my homebrew power supply is I think a three or four amp five volt power supply in there along with a one amp nine volt AC power supply. So I do use this adapter or I guess I'll keep this one handy. In fact, it's so small, I'll just stick it right on top of the little power supply here. So whenever I need to work on a 128, I don't even have to go looking for this one. And then finally, we have these chips that Brett sent in. So we have a Super PLA. Oh, that's interesting. I was, don't know if I know that one. Oh, it's a PLA for a 64C. That's pretty handy. Um, you know, I don't think in all my repairs of 64Cs, I've ever had to change one of these. I've definitely seen Jan Beta had to change one on a machine he had but I've just never had a bad one. These are very much more reliable than the ones on the later, uh, earlier machines, I mean. What is this sticker on the bottom? I can't really see Put on my headset here. It says original authentic. Who put that sticker on there? That can't be a Commodore thing, is it? Uh, let's see, who makes this one? These were made by third parties. Can't quite tell. Has an S on there, so maybe that means sharp. No, no, uh, Commodore, I don't think was making these chips by the point, by this point, by the time the 64C came out, or at least the later ones, uh, they had third parties making their PLA for them. And they integrated a bunch of stuff on the motherboard into this uh, high density, high pin out PLA. And henceforth, it's much more reliable than those original ones, which were super duper unreliable. Not to mention pretty much all the chips on the 64C, it does say 64C right here, were much more reliable. Like they, they're just, those machines, if you're gonna buy a 64 and you don't need to have a bread bin, get a 64C. Cause like the later versions with the short board it's called, it's just a smaller version that has uh, this PLA on it. They're much more likely to work and stay working. Pretty much the only thing that goes wrong on those things is I think the RAM goes bad more than anything. At least that's what I've found. And then we just have a whole little assortment of these TTL ICs and uh, Yep, they've been desoldered from C16. So I don't know, you know, usually, usually what I do when I get these is I don't go through and test them all. Unlike floppy disks, I don't know. I just kind of assume that these TTL chips are gonna work. I have like a rather large collection. In fact, I have several anti-static bags over there just filled with them. They just seem to work all the time. They're, they're just seemingly quite reliable. And I think if I'm doing a repair on a machine and I find a bad TTL chip, or this is obviously some RAM chips here as well, I'll just swap it in with one that I haven't tested. And if it fixes the problem, then great. And if there's still an issue or the issue is different, then maybe I will then test the chip on a chip tester or just use my oscilloscope to actually look at the signals and make sure that everything looks correct. Because 
Yeah, I mean, as as Brett mentioned, um, one of the problems, oh, and I'm noticing this foam is old. So if you have old foam that you stick chips into, don't leave the chips in there because uh, what can happen is it starts to degrade and it actually eats into the legs and it's starting to on these. And if you leave it long enough, it will completely corrode the legs on your ICs. I've had a bunch of chips that were given to me stuck in foam like this, and a lot of them were ruined because the, the legs had gone bad. Now, I don't know how long it takes for the foam to degrade like that. It might be 30, 40 years, something like that. But I can tell by just the feel of this stuff, it's not soft and supple anymore, like the original anti-static foam. Plus, there's like foam dust in here, which kind of tells me it's breaking down. So I'm just going to pop all these out of it. And what I usually do is I'll just put them loose like this into an anti-static bag, and I'll just mark it on the outside um, miscellaneous chips for future testing. So this is something I need to do at some point in the future is come up with a system of organizing my ICs. Now, whether it's a little storage organizer with a bunch of drawers on it, and I put labels for like, you know, 74LS00 to 09 and 10 to 0 to 19, stuff like that, and then just sort the chips into those bins, that would be really ideal because right now um, I have a real problem where there's just, they're all over the place, these chips, and it takes me quite a long time to find any particular TTL chip I need because they're not organized in any sense of the word. And unfortunately for me, I try to prioritize making videos. And then of course, after that, replying to Patreon messages and then replying to emails and things like organization down here, it just doesn't make the list very often. So maybe one day I'll get a helper of some kind or a, an intern or someone who would like to help out and come up with a good organization system for me. Till that time, I'm just gonna struggle with a kind of a disastrous chip situation down here. <laughs> All right, so that's it from the stuff from Brett. So thanks very much, Brett, for sending in this stuff. I, uh, I do appreciate it. I'm just gonna put the PLA in there and let's go on to the next package. Okay, the next package here comes from Jason in San Francisco, California. Hi to all my California viewers. I'm sure there's a good number of them because California is a very populous state. Now, while we have this package I just got here from Jason, I also have something else that he sent in and this was given to me uh, like via another person. So might as well combine this stuff together um, and show it all at the same time. So Jason is working on a whole bunch of stuff for the NABU. In fact, look at this, some NABU stickers in the box. So I wouldn't be surprised if uh, what he sent in here is NABU related and uh, what I already have as well, is also NABU related. So let's see, we have two letters. I guess we'll start with the thing that I already had. So this right here is a NABU interposer or let's call it a NABU serial interposer. So the serial port on the NABU is an RS-422 port. And to use that with a modern computer, and I haven't really had a follow up NABU video, but I will soon. To use a NABU with a, a modern computer, you can use some software that you run on your on your modern machine and it will act as the like cable system that sends software to the NABU. And you need to use an RS-422 to USB converter and then you can plug into your laptop or your whatever. And then you can act as if you have a cable TV head end for loading software, things like that. The interposer here goes underneath one of the serial ICs that are on the motherboard. And then right on here, there's one of those standard kind of cheap uh, UARTs, and then you can plug the USB cable into here just directly into your computer. So it eliminates the need to have one of those RS-422 uh, devices. Not to mention, you could take something like a Raspberry Pi, which I thought I had sitting on my bench, but I don't, and put it right inside your NABU and act as the server or whatever. So you turn your NABU on and it will have all the software and everything just loaded directly right over this. I also heard that when you're using this, you can increase the baud rate or the bits per second faster than you can with the built-in interface or that regular RS-422 interface. So it means that you can load software even more quickly over this than you could using that external thing. Let's take a look at what Jason's letter is here. Let's see what he says. Dear Adrian, I think it's fair to say that your video on the NABU personal computer has sparked a huge wave of enthusiasm in these previously obscure machines. It was the first I'd heard of them, and of course, I had to buy one or two. I've been having an absolute blast with it and thought I'd send you a token of my appreciation. As you probably already know, the serial port on the NABU uh, to the cable TV interface uses RS-422 
422. And a lot of folks have been using readily available USB R422 dongle, blah, blah, that's, that's I bought one of those and I haven't tried it yet. I've tested the NABU uh, at the computer club meeting here. So I know my NABU does boot software and it works properly. So uh, there is that, but I've never even tried the dongle thing that I have. Enclose is an interposer board from the NABU Western Digital serial chip uh, that gets the RS-422 out of the picture entirely and the interface is directly to an FTDI serial chip. Just plug the TR-1863 into an interposer and plug the interposer into your NABU socket and then you have a direct USB hookup to your Mac or PC or Linux machine as well. You'll need to remove one of the expansion slot plates in the back of the NABU to feed the USB cable through. I'm planning a 3D printed black bank plate to drill a hole for the cable. The board lets you select 115.2 baud rate instead of the oddball 111.8 that the NABU uses natively and also has a jumper that lets you enable automatic RTS, RCS, or sorry, RTS, CTS flow control. Looks like this was based off another project and uh, he has just modified it to add some flow control stuff. So yeah, I will put a link in the description to where you can get this. I'm assuming it's an open source project. Uh, it doesn't say in the letter there, but I'm assuming it is. So I'll put a link so you can uh, make one of these if you so need to, uh, well, you know, access your NABU without all the silly external adapters. We have a couple NABU stickers here. This is what came today in the package. So that's cool. And let's see what this other letter says. Oh, we got more NABU stickers here. This other letter says, uh, Dear Adrian, as the NABU arrived, I got thinking, hey, it should be fun to use this uh, keyboard as a daily driver every once in a while. So remember, if you saw my NABU video, the keyboard as a really nice, if I recall, Alps SKCC keyboard, or it may be a different key switch. I can't remember, but I think it was an Alps based keyboard. It feels really nice to type on. And, you know, obviously, I'm sure a lot of people bought NABUs and just to harvest the keyboard and those brand new unused keyboard switches. You know, it's an unfortunate thing. And I know other people have made videos about this, but the keyboard modding community, um, they have a history sometimes of buying rare and obscure computers. There aren't that many NABUs left on the planet. You know, this is a recently discovered cache. But if you go on eBay and you see a NABU for sale minus the keyboard, you can be pretty much sure that someone bought it to harvest the keyboard. Because the original price of the NABUs was like 70 bucks or whatever it was. That's a really good price for virgin, unused, old vintage keyboard mechanical switches. Well, I'm sure some people harvested them. Either way, um, Jason has gone ahead and designed an adapter. Let's you hook the NABU keyboard up to a Mac, PC, Linux, et cetera, et cetera. It understands USB uh, keyboards and HID game controllers. In addition to the keyboard, it supports garden variety Atari style joysticks as game controller. Oh, so I guess if you plug the NABU keyboard into your modern computer using this adapter here, let's take a look at what it looks like here. Okay, yeah, oh look, it's got a Pi on there. Yeah, like a Raspberry Pi, um, uh, what is this, a RP2040. That's cool, open source uh, microcontroller here. So on the NABU, the actual joystick ports are on the keyboard itself and uses this DIN connector here. So I think if you plug your keyboard into this, plug this USB into your computer, then you not only get the, the keyboard working, but you get all the joystick ports as well. So if you have a NABU and you wanna use your old Atari style joysticks. I don't know why anyone would want to use those on a modern computer, but if you want to play like a modern game with one of those, then there you go, you can. And I guess if you, uh, well, if you're going to emulate a NABU and you manage to have just the NABU keyboard for some reason, but not the computer, well, then you could probably use this plus MAME, and then you get access to the original joysticks plus, you know, all that stuff. So that's pretty cool. I like it. It's got, uh, let's zoom in a little closer here, open source hardware. That's freaking awesome. There is a DC barrel connection here, so I'm assuming, yeah, you're going to need that to power up probably the keyboard and everything else. My assumption is when you plug in the USB to your computer, it is not enough power for the whole keyboard. So that's what this DC jack is, probably a 5-volt DC input. He probably talks about it in this letter, so I'll zoom out and let's just see here. Yeah, PyPico, all the design files for him are on GitHub, so there is the URL. I'll put that in the description. This is a bunch of information on how it works. Key mappings, important keys in the NABU keyboard don't natively support. Uh, there's like, there's no backslash key. So you're gonna use it on a PC, you need a backslash key. So I guess there's a shortcut or something for that. Anyways, I hope you have fun. Okay, thanks, Jason. That is freaking cool. I, I do like projects like this. Unfortunately, my NABU is not handy right now. Um, it's sort of under a pile of boxes and stuff. It's in its original box. So when I do a NABU follow-up, uh, it'll be worth uh, bringing this out and showing it off that I can use that keyboard on other things, not to mention, I definitely am gonna get this interposer working. And what does it say on here, by the way? Let me look at this a little closer. There's some writing here. 
Nabu FTDI serial adapter, mygeekhobby.com. And Jason here. So, okay. So sweet. Thank you very much, Jason, for sending this stuff in. And uh, yeah, I'll have to break this all out when I finally get around to that Nabu follow-up video, which will be coming soon. Because if you haven't been following, there is a lot of development in the Nabu community right now around software and registries and like ways to do stuff. You can run CPM on there and people have made replicas for the hard drive interfaces and the floppy controllers and all that stuff and enabled all this cool functionality on Nabu that when I tested it, didn't really exist. Okay, so the next package here comes from Deutschland. Hi to all my German viewers. It comes from viewer Volker. Uh oh, we have packing peanuts in here, so I have to be careful with this. I gotta tip this into the uh, garbage can here. Make sure these don't go all over the basement. All right, so we have a little box here. And what is this? Oh, right. The retro Arju input. Oh, right. Okay. Volker emailed me about this. This is such a cool project. I really, oh, okay. I'm, I'm getting excited about this one. Look at this printed manual. This rocks as well. So the USB retro Ardu, Ardu, Ardu input project based on Arduino Mega 2560, and it translates modern USB interface standards to old devices. So this is like the reverse of the keyboard thing we just looked at, which converts an old device to USB to use on a modern computer. This is backwards. So this takes a USB keyboard and probably USB joysticks and things like that, I don't know for sure, and then allows you to use them with old retro devices. Because honestly, that's one of the biggest problems we always have, right? Like you, I don't know, you get something and you're missing the keyboard for it. Say like you have a Tandy 1000 or some machine that uses a, a non-standard PC keyboard. Well, you know, you want to use your, uh, you know, your wireless keyboard like this with it. And it's just not that easy. But since the wireless keyboard and the mouse that goes with it, cheap thing here is a little wireless dongle. I think you could plug it into this and then it would just work with all sorts of, of old stuff. I zoom up, people can read it. The inspiration for this it's from Adrian Black, YouTube, Adrian's Digital Basement, who developed a similar converter for the PS2 to 1001000 based on the Arduino. His code, link in the chapter source, is also uh, one in which the Tandy outputs of the Retro Arduino is based on, and one in which I developed for other keyboard protocols by changing the timings and the behavior. <laughs> That's freaking awesome. I mean, like, in a way, it wasn't like I originated that converter idea. I thought, oh, I could just make one myself. And I think there's other open source ones, or maybe they're not, maybe they're closed source. I don't know. So I, I made that thing just thinking, oh, this will this will work. And um, sure enough, it did. I made a video about it. I'll link in the description below to that. And uh, Volker went ahead and he used that code and I guess he adapted it to other things. Uh, the well-known USB host shield library, uh, from Felis is probably used by everyone who works with Arduino, known as USB hosts. A few more code snippets, especially um, in the ADB area, so that'd probably be for the uh, uh, Macintosh keyboards, not Adrian's digital basement, were taken over from other open source projects, and a lot of work was and time was invested. Let's skip ahead to what is supported. So PCXT, which is freaking awesome because I mean, even me, I have I have XT keyboards, but I don't have that many. I have I don't know, a couple Model Fs and a few other switchable ones, but to have a box that easily converts, and it, honestly, if you go on eBay and you look up the price of PCXT keyboards right now, they're, it's a lot, but you could just buy a PS2 keyboard for next to nothing. In fact, if you go to like your computer recycler or thrift store, they're probably gonna have some PS2 keyboards just floating around that you can get for like a few bucks or whatever. So that's cool. So XT, AT, PS2, different scan code sets, Amiga 500, 2000, and 3000. So yes, indeed, the Amiga 500 is an internal keyboard, but it actually uh, uses the same protocol as the 2000 and 3000. Tandy 1000, um, and Apple verse, uh, via uh, the Apple desktop bus connection. So it doesn't support, uh, well, mice. No, it doesn't support the original Mac Plus, Mac 128, and a Mac 512. I'm sure it can with some changes, and that might be something that, you know, be nice to add to this project because those keyboards are kind of expensive as well. And they get harvested by the key switch people because they also have Alps SKCC switches in them. It supports mice, serial mice, PS2 mice, Amiga and Atari mice, C64, mouse, really? Currently no 1351 proportional mouse. So joy mouse. I don't really know what that means exactly. I don't know if there's like two different modes. Oh, I see. 1351 is the later Commodore mouse that's for the C128 and the C64. 
you would use that with Geos and some games and stuff like that. But there's an original 1350, which must use joystick ports. So that's too bad. Um, there are other adapters out there for the 1351, but I think that mouse is really hard to find and very expensive. I happen to have one here. I'm very lucky to have one, but I think finding one of those nowadays is, is really difficult. They didn't sell a whole lot of them. Also supports the Apple mouse via ADB again. And then here are the joysticks. So it supports the analog joysticks of the PCs. It supports the Tandy, a TRCD, Coco, and Tano Dragon. Those all use the same connector for the, the joystick. Oh, I guess also the BBC Micro. And then Commodore Atari digital joysticks and stuff, including the Dead Zone. So, yeah, so that's cool. So it doesn't support, right off the bat, I'm noticing is Apple II joysticks, which are analog and similar to PC joysticks, but not the same. And it doesn't support, uh, well, it supports ADB, but it doesn't support the, the keyboard from the Mac 128 through the Mac Plus. So those are the two additions that would be nice to have. And then there is all sorts of info on the connectors. I mean, this documentation is amazing here. Uh, really amazing. Uh, don't use hubs. There's some known limitations there. Oh yeah, so here it is working with uh, DualShock Dreamcast controller. I'm assuming that some of these, like to use a Dreamcast controller, you would need something to convert from it to USB, right? Um, what am I missing here? Let's go back. Let's go back to the connector section. I mean, you know what? I should just take it out of the box. Stop looking at the manual here. Look at all these adapters here. This is freaking awesome. Okay, so here's the box. <laughs> Super Mario Harry Bows. These, oh, okay, I'm sorry. I got it. I got to cut into these. I know I don't do candy reviews anymore, but German Harry Bows and their Super Mario brand and their sour. Oops, I just dropped one out of the box here. Yeah, it's pretty good. It's sour, not too sweet at all. And it's not like overly sour, full of citric acid. It's just not overly sweetened. And um, wow, really yum. And what else do we have here? We got, oh, we got more Super Mario. Oh, and it has the um, the little white stuff in there. I don't know what that's called. Milk stuff, really like it. Oh, well, they have like three different versions of this. Pinch, uh, Princess Peach and cool. Okay, so a box from JLPCB. See what this is. I'll just empty everything out of the box, actually. Something that's 3D printed and <laughs> it looks really cool. <laughs> Really, really cool. This project is obviously a passion project and uh, a lot of thought and energy has gone into it. So there it is, the uh, retro Arju input. We got various switches here, one and two. We got AT, PS2 there. We have PC XT on that side and then Apple and Amiga. I don't quite know how to use these switches. Um, I'm assuming because there's two bits here, it must be uh, like two bit binary. So uh, zero, zero is probably Apple and you know, one, two, three, that kind of thing. Anyhow, um, let's see what else is on here. Okay, here are the keyboard connections. So hopefully you can see that. Apple desktop bus, PS2 mouse. We got keyboard uh, for AT, XT, PS2, Tandy 1000 and Amiga. So the one thing you do need is you need to get a DIN cable that goes from this to your computer. Now for something like a PC or an Amiga, it's just like a five pin DIN, it's pretty common stuff. But the Tandy 1000, well, it can use the same DIN connector, but it has more pins on there. Uh, just so you don't like turn the connector and plug it in the wrong way, you should probably use the correct DIN connector. And obviously for PS2 keyboards, you just need to use an adapter that goes from AT down to the PS2 size. And then on the back here, Amiga Atari mouse, digital joystick, PC serial mouse, and then we have the analog uh, joystick port for the PC. And on this side, we got 12 volts in, programming for the Arduino, and there is the USB port inside there. That's on a shield, obviously. And what's this here? Ah, letter, cool. Okay, uh, we'll look at that in a second. I just went right to the manual because it was so awesome. Let's take a look at what's in here. Well, I think what this is, I'm not reading the letter yet. I think this goes from the mouse port that's on here, this one. Amiga Atari mouse. You would connect that to this with a cable. And then this allows you to remap it, so to speak, because over here, uh, let's see if I zoom in a little bit, and put my goggles back on. Microsoft Import, Acorn, Acorn Archimedes, Head Start Explorer, 
mouse or computer. And it's the connector there that those things use for their mouse. And then this one here says next cube mouse or computer. I don't know. I don't fully understand what's going on here because uh, these as well to the Amiga Atari Amstrad computer or to Lisa PC 98. And then there's all these things here. Is this for like putting jumpers? Amstrad, Atari, Amiga, Archimedes. Yeah, I don't know. Not quite sure. But I do know one thing is that the mouse protocol on a lot of these systems, like from the Mac Plus all the way up to all this import stuff, it's, uh, oh, I'm forgetting the name of it, but the, the protocol it uses is very similar. And usually the only difference between one computer and another is the pinout, and that's it. Or maybe like the polarity and stuff like that. So I have a feeling that this is a little thing to help you matrix matrixify those signals and map them into the correct pinout for your particular computer. All right, so the letter says, as announced by mail, I'm sending you these two input adapters. I hope the 3D printed cases survive shipping. Yeah, no problems at all. They totally survived. I tried to pack it as well as possible. And yeah, like I said, worked perfectly. Harry Bow makes um, pretty good packing material as well. <laughs> as there's a long break in the running gag of sending you your favorite Harry Bow, I included some, some special retro ones, which hopefully improve protection too. Yeah, thumbs up to that. First is the Prime Project, which is the USB retro Arduino, Arduino, Arduino input, Arduino input. You know, I'm really having a hard time saying that. So that's this box right here. It's an Arduino based USB to retro converter that was inspired by your work and includes the code from your PS2 to Tandy. Okay, I talked about that from the letter. The Tandy is quite rare in Germany, so I can't test it. The Amiga implementation was tested on A500, which used the same protocol as A2000, except it handles the keyboard reset differently. In the Tandy mode, the keyboard connector is repinned mechanically. So a one-to-one -one five or eight pin DIN cable should work and do the trick. That's as I mentioned, you do need a cable to connect the DIN there into the, the computer. The project is open source and you can find the whole sources for the Arduino sketch, the case, STLs, keycab project with the PCB on my GitHub. Of course, I'll put that in the link in the description. Open source stuff is just so great. It really is amazing. The community, I mean, so much work has clearly gone into this. And the fact it's all available for anyone just to make themselves just to totally, totally rocks. And then there's an introduction video, which we'll take a look at together in a second. The Volker says here that it seems like some things are not quite working yet. ADB and PS2 mouse support. There's also the culprit that I have not been able to source perfectly working USB host shields for the Arduino in Germany since longer. So sent for a long time. I wonder what's causing that. That's interesting. I didn't know that. The bug will need you to power the Arduino via USB via a source that is limited to 500 milliamps or lower, which will cause the internal five volts to slightly collapse to around 4.5 to 4.7, which then it suddenly works. <laughs> what? I will address a workaround for this in the future. Retro Arduino modular, which uh, should be ready in the mid end of the year, also comes with a new interface for the C64 paddle and the 1351 mouse. Okay, that's awesome. So support is coming for those. When trying out the joystick interface on the BBC Micro, please consider also use the DB15, but a different pinout and the switches need to be set to pot to ground, same as the Tandy with the adapter, and select the right joystick in the firmware. The second thing, uh, which is a lot easier to use, is this, the Bus-O-Matic, where you can simply repin any mouse that uses a two-bit gray code or quadrature code, that's what I was trying to say, quadrature code to work on other interfaces. Please check if the ground and 5 volt is proper between uh, before connecting devices. I could not test all interfaces. For the head start, it could be that the middle and right buttons are swapped. I originally thought about including this in the modular version of the Retro Arduino, but the most popular one out there would have the Amiga tank mouse or some converter, uh, which seemed more useful to me. All right, cool. Well, you know what I don't think I have is, I guess I'm gonna have to try to find DIN cables that get this to focus here. I, I need to find DIN cables that work with this? I don't know. Is this like the one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, nine pin? Uh, and one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. I, I don't know, there's two different DINs there. So I, I guess I need to find cables to do further testing on it. I think, uh, unfortunately, this this project, as as awesome as this is, is probably a little bit more complicated uh, for testing than I can do in a mail call video. So this will have to be 
for a future time when I finally get around to, I need to order some cables and stuff like that. And I can then finally actually give this a try. But what we're gonna do in the meantime is let's uh, take a look at this video together, this introduction video to kind of get a feel for it since I'm not gonna be doing more of an intro than what I've talked about already. Alrighty, here's Volker's channel. Let's take a look and find the video that's related. Ah, here it is. Looks like he has a German version and an English version. Uh, I did preview a little bit of the English version already, so let's click it. So here it is, the USB Retro Arduino oh, input. I like the green LEDs My personal color there. scheme resembles the old IBM PCs with light gray front, mid gray case, red switches and black rear panel. On the left side we find the Arduino USB port, a power jacket and the USB host port. Due to the way the host shield is made, this sits a little bit recessed. We find the keyboard mode select switches. The lower switch selects between PC80 and XT, or if the mid switch is selected between Apple and Amiga. The upper switch cap is quite hefty as it changes 5 switches, which also change the pinout of the keyboard connector to 10D. In the middle row, the upper switch changes the serial mouse between 2 button Microsoft and 3 button Logitech mode. The middle one selects if the digital joystick port reacts to a mouse or joystick, and the lower one selects between Amiga and Atari mouse pinout. The left switches pull the output of the analog pots to ground, which might be required for BBC or Tandy. Okay, enough theory, time for some practice. We start with an XT class machine and a USB composite hit, meaning mouse and keyboard operating over one wireless dongle. The keyboard already shows off while loading Cute Mouse. Here we see Cute Mouse is loading in Microsoft mode, so with two buttons. So let's unload the driver and on the Retro Ardo input we flip the mouse mode switch and firmly press the reset button. And now the driver loads in Logitech mode, which is three buttons. So that's pretty cool. Right there alone, being able to use this for XT keyboard emulation and serial mouse, either two button or three button, using these wireless things, it's very, very useful. So I'll put a link down in the description to Volker's channel and of course this video if you want to check this out but I'm looking forward to playing around with this box and kind of exploring all of its capabilities. Like I said, I'll need to order some cables and things. I forgot he included this little jumper block, which I think goes with this thing. And it does look like it is the same exact cables that I would need to hook this up to an Amiga and also a PCXT or an AT for that matter. That's just extra convenient. Now, me personally, I happen to have a lot of hardware, so I have serial mice, Amiga mice, keyboards and stuff like all that stuff handy. I can't keep it around on the bench here. So whenever I'm working on those machines, I don't have to go looking very far for that stuff. But if you are starting to amass a collection of retro computers and you happen to lack some of the peripherals, well, a project like this, of course, can help you out big time because the prices on those peripherals are not coming down. And honestly, if you have to spend like 50 bucks on a serial mouse or $50 on an Amiga mouse, you might as well spend a bit of time and effort, build up this project and then save that money. So as I mentioned, I will put links to the project and Volker's channel in the description below. And Volker, thank you very much for sending in your project. And of course, the Harry Bows all the way from Germany. I really appreciate it. And yeah, look for me using this in future videos once I figure out how to do it. <laughs> Alrighty, moving on, we have another package here. This one comes from Mark and Sarah in Fort Collins, Colorado. And actually there's a little note right here. It says, open from the bottom. So let's flip this over and... Uh, do what I normally do. I usually do open it from the bottom just to avoid recording the label. All right, let's see what we got in here. We have a note, some environmentally friendly packing material. Ah, looks like we got some tools and more tools and a little candy. And some more packing material. Okay, so what do we have here? We got some Twizzlers nibs. These are, um, let me center myself in the camera here. These are pretty good little candies, actually. I kind of like them. They're just uh, cherry flavored little, um, I don't know, little nibs. <laughs> and the reason why Mark and Sarah went ahead and sent those in, and if we take a look at the note here, it's because in the video where I added RGB to my Sony TV, I really struggled to eat away at the back cover so I could install some RCA jacks for the inputs, or no, I installed a DB9 or DE9 jack on the back of the TV. So Mark emailed me and was like, hey, you should get a nibbler tool, which I have never used actually. And this is it right here. So let's get that little thing off. And I guess what a nibbler is, if you see there, when I pull the handle in, that little thing there, and maybe if I use paper, it'll be a little more visible. It goes like that and it will nibble away at metal and or plastic and there's a little picture there. So you drill a little hole to start 
and then you can nibble your way around. Let's try it on this um, plastic cover there. Oh, look there. You can make nice little J's. Very nice. Aluminum, copper, plastic, and other unhardened metal up to 1.2 millimeters. And you just start with a 9.5 millimeters or 3 eighths of an inch hole to start and designed to fit in the palm of your hand for easy use. A nibbling tool. I love it. I'm trying to get centered here. All right, uh, what are we gonna do? I'm gonna nibble, let's try nibbling out this cardboard first. All right, so it is nibbling without any issue. Now, I don't think it's really designed for cardboard because it's uh, kind of jamming up a little bit. But there it is, I created a little nibble in there. Let's try this plastic here. Yeah, that, that totally works. I guess you kind of get your technique down uh, once you get used to it. Oh, this is scintillating video right here, watching me nibble away at plastic. That created a very hard to see, but <laughs> okay, it's really hard to see because it's clear. That's, uh, that worked really well. This is gonna be super useful to me. Now, I'm sure viewers watching have probably used these and are like, well, duh, you should have had one of these already. But I guess I've just, I don't know. I've heard of these, just never used them. Now, if you're watching this and you're familiar with using one of these and you have techniques you can give me on the best way to say if I have to install a DB25 connector in the back of a, a plastic shell or something, what is the right technique to use this so you have a nice, good cutout that doesn't have jagged edges and stuff like that? That's, uh, that's what I'm kind of looking for. Uh, back to the letter here. So the nibbling tool is Jamco 18810. Also have a set of the diagonal flush cutters also from Jamco. Now these might be legit. <laughs> I have a lot of illegitimate flush cutters. Yeah, Play-Doh, ESD safe. Let's get some of the fakey ones I have here. Here's a fake one. Yeah, I get these uh, fake ones from China and it says model 170. And this is a Model 175. I gotta say this has a much more ergonomic feeling handle than my cheapy cheap ones. It also doesn't open as far though. So that might be a little harder to cut things, but you know what? These flush cutters are freaking great. And I buy these really cheap ones knowing that they're junk and I end up you know, damaging them by cutting on something that's a bit too uh, hard, the metal for the blades. So it damages these and just throw them away because I buy them in like packs of 10 and they cost a couple dollars each. But it is nice to have uh, the legit real deal here, <laughs> which I don't think I've ever had. I'm assuming these are legit, but knowing Jamco, it makes sense that they are. Also, uh, including the Twizzlers and nibs, candy for nibbling on while you use your new nibbler. Let me have another nib. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And the letter goes on to say, thanks for everything you do for the channel and the retro community, Mark and Sarah, AKA Wild Butterfly. Two Apple 2GS smart slash cool kids. <laughs> that goes back to the video I did. Oh, I don't remember. I think it was a mail call episode where a viewer sent in a 2GS and it had the original manual. And the Apple 2GS manual has all these photos of like kids and using the 2GS in various scenes. And uh, yeah, it just, the kids all look too cool for school, as they say. And I, I kind of was tongue in cheek doing a review of the ma of the uh, the manual. I'll put a link in the description to that video. If you haven't seen it, it was like a, mail call video back on the main channel, back when I used to have them there and I didn't have a second channel. So sweet, thank you very much, Mark and Sarah for the nibbler tool, the Twizzler nibs and the actual real deal, I think it's the real deal, Plato flush cutters. I love it. Okay, we have another package and I'm just gonna wipe away all these nibs or uh, not nibs, the little nibbled bits of cardboard and plastic I put all over the bench. Alrighty, the next package here, this one, well, this comes from, it says candy enclosed. Oh, here it is, Jeff, uh, from somewhere in Texas. Uh, I can't quite tell where, there's no city name. Uh, hello to all my Texas viewers. Let's see what this is, candy, huh? Boy, this is a candy episode. It, people haven't been sending in much candy, which um, my doctor appreciates that because of my weight, I'm trying to keep that under control. But it seems like on this one, uh, this will be what? Like the third package that has candy in it. Hmm. All right, so we got a letter here. Something wrapped in paper. Something in an original box. 
and we got some candy. There it is. That's it. All righty. Well, uh, the Harry Bows here. Hey, cacao. So, oh, these are German actually. Uh, hmm. Okay. Looks like chocolate milk flavor, maybe. Kind of interesting. The letter may explain explain the deal with these, but I'm going to try one right now. There they are. They look like a little bottle with milk on the top. Mm. Got a little bit of chocolatey flavor and then that kind of milk um, Haribo, the white color stuff. That's pretty tasty. I wouldn't say it's just like chocolate milk, but it's pretty yummy. All right, here it is the letter. Hello from Texas. Thanks to all the great content that both reminds me of my childhood and lets me share with my teenage son. Hey, that's awesome. We're always on the lookout for the next Digital Basement or Digital Basement 2 video to hit our YouTube feeds. We recently boxed up our Apple IIe system and put most of it in storage, ending up with a few extra things we wanted to send your way. In the box, you'll find the Apple IIe numeric keypad. Now, I knew the Apple IIe could have one. I have never seen one in person. This is something that plugs into a connector that's inside the computer. And for the original Apple IIe's, there was no number keypad on it, just the normal keyboard. It was a little bit of an extension from the original Apple II keyboard, two or two plus but no number pad. So I guess there were, Apple made the number pad, which I think is gonna be in this box here. Plus maybe there were third party ones. I'm not too sure about that. Later, Apple released the platinum Apple IIe that had the built in number pad. But I think that came out after the Apple II GS came out, which of course included a keyboard that already had the number pad on it because it was Apple desktop bus. So I guess they figured, uh, well, they would go back to the Apple IIe and integrate that into the case. And you know, that's what they did. Anyhow, as far as I know, this was Apple's first external keyboard product, and this one seems to be new in box. It was missing the motherboard connector, so I included a replacement. Oh, well, that's cool. Also, we have a sequential system SuperCom serial card for the 2E. It's a super serial clone, but some online resources mention it has a built-in terminal program and grappler support. I was unable to verify either feature. There's also a modern Mockingboard sound card for the Apple IIe by Reactive Micro. This card is the latest revision with a few bug fixes. It also includes a jumper to route your internal speaker up through the card. Flip the polarity if you don't, if it doesn't work the first time. Also a stack of Apple II programs and system discs for various systems. And finally, we have Harry Bo. Hey, Cacao. I bought a bag of these German chocolate milk candies in the International Airport Terminal last year, and they are all gone before I left the tarmac. I imported a case at Christmas and wanted to send you one. Well, that's cool. Thank you very much for that, Jeff. Uh, Jeff and Luke. <laughs> that's rad. <laughs> I gotta say. Mmm. <laughs> yeah, those are quite good. Kind of a nice chocolatey flavor. Um, okay, where do we start here? Well, let's start with what's wrapped in in the paper here, which I'm thinking are the floppy disks. Alrighty, they are indeed. Let's zoom up a little bit. The labels have deteriorated as as what happens. Boy, I can't even read this one. Uh, it's Apple logo. Here's Apple logo to program disc. It's for the 128 2E and 2C. It's ProDOS based. And Apple logo to side one. Uh, what's the difference with these exactly? I'm not sure. Looks like it's double sided though. Apple logo to side two. They didn't even notch it. So it is right protected. Yeah, this one here says program disk, and this one doesn't. Is this double-sided as well? Nope, it is not. So I used Logo back in the day when I was, well, the very first time I used an Apple II computer was actually in elementary school. I had a VIC-20 at the time, and in our elementary school, this was back in Montreal, Canada, they had a little computer lab. Mm, what year would this have been? I'm thinking 1982 or 83 or so. And I had my VIC-20 at home, as I said, but in the lab, it was Apple IIs or two pluses. I don't remember which one they were. Monochrome screens. They had disk drives with them. And I remember going in there because, you know, if you had an aptitude, they didn't have a specific computer class, but if you had a computer aptitude, I think you could sign up or something like that and then go use the lab. And I remember going to the principal's office to buy a floppy disk because my VIC-20, I only had a data set, so cassettes. I wasn't using disks. So what they did is in the, in the principal's office, they had some boxes of floppies and you could go buy one disk at a time. And this was, of course, if you were gonna go use the computer lab, you needed to save your programs and you could save them onto those disks. And I remember they're charging like a couple bucks for them or maybe it was $5, or something like that. That would have been Canadian dollars back then. And I am not 100% sure if I went into that 
little lab like at recess or at lunchtime to go use those computers. But I definitely had some courses in there or like a teacher was present and we were learning Logo. And uh, since I already knew how to program basic for my VIC-20, Logo is pretty simplistic. And I remember there were some exercises to do like draw a flower and you had to like do some subroutines, you know, with variables and stuff like that. And I remember I whipped that out so quickly and I remember writing writing it and I said to the teacher or whoever's like, okay, I'm here it is, I'm, I'm done. They're like, you can't be done. It's only been like five minutes or whatever it was. And I'm like, well, no, look, run. And it, you know, drew a little a bunch of flowers and stuff on the screen. <laughs> and they were like, oh, wow, you are done. And I was like, yeah, I already know how to program in basic. So yeah, I don't, I don't remember this really a lot of specifics in there other than I'm telling you it was like an old broom closet or something. And there was maybe room for five or six computers and they just had little desks on the sides and the teacher would sort of stand and like look over your shoulder as you were working and just like, I, I don't know. Yeah, it's really kind of a funny thing, but that's why I remember using logo. So it's funny to see 128K logo here uh, because those Apple IIs clearly didn't have 128. I don't know who made that original logo. If it was an earlier version of Apple logo that um, ran with less memory or whatever, but um, yeah, I guess later they came out with this higher resolution version. If you've never used Logo, all it is is a very simplistic programming language. And I would almost hesitate to say it's not not really, well, I guess it is a language, uh, but it's essentially about controlling a pen on a virtual piece of paper. So you go pen down and go forward 10 and that draws a line like 10. And then you say right turn 45 degrees and it will turn the turtle as it calls it, which is a little, I don't know, looks like a pointer basically and that's what's going to draw the line so you turn it 45 degrees and you do another 10 forward and then it will draw at a, at an angle at 45 degrees so it's very easy to draw shapes and you can create little subroutines where you know you're like right turn right turn right turn and you can end up drawing cool circular patterns and stuff like that it's very slow but it's very very easy to understand and uh and that's the main reason why it was good educational language back in the day and it's much simpler to use than even basic not to mention on AppleSoft Basic, drawing lines and shapes and stuff wasn't super straightforward, but with Logo, it was actually really easy because that's what it was really designed for. Anyhow, we got two Logo discs. Uh, we have this disc with a green label, which says, it says Apple presents the 2E, an introduction, Pascal based. And on the back here, it says Apple at play, Prodos based. We have system utilities here, nothing on the back. Getting down to basic, gosh, I remember some of these discs here. I never had a 2E, I had a 2C, but some of these came with that. The Apple at work, writing, finance, and filing. Oh, that sounds so exciting. Another more of that on the back. There's the Apple 2GS diagnostic disc on a five and a quarter inch. I think that's easily and widely available on the internet. You can download that if you need it, but I'm surprised it comes on a five and a quarter inch. And exploring Apple logo. And on the back here, the inside story, I think, about the Apple II. All right, that's pretty cool. All original Apple II discs, except for this one here, but the cool label here, neat. All righty, so here's the expansion cards. Now, on the Franklin Ace video series, I was doing a video about 80 column cards, and I remember saying that I have a bunch of cards to test. I had like a box full of cards. I think um, I'm gonna have to add these to that same box of cards. There was like an 80 column card in there and some other stuff. Um, here's the super calm. Wow. Okay, cool. So, yep, it's got the little expansion header here, which looks slightly homemade, but all righty. But yes, that's a large ROM chip here. So if this has built-in programs, you probably access it somehow either by uh, using machine language monitor to go to a particular location and start it from there. I have to look up the documentation on this, but got to admit, I've never heard of this. Now, I am lucky enough to have a good number of Super Serial cards, which is great for using ADT Pro and stuff like that. But this sounds really kind of cool. And next up, there is this, which is the Mockingboard. This is the reactive Mockingboard. Now, the Mockingboard is a sound card for the Apple II. This is the revised version. I don't know what exactly is different about this, but it's a clone of the original because luckily these ICs here are relatively easy to get. Now, the way this card works is there are a couple 6522. So these are VIAs or versatile interface adapters and they talk to the sound chips right here. Now, it's funny that there's two of these, but I suppose maybe there weren't enough IO lines on each one of these to talk to both sound chips. So you could just use one via for both. 
And what these empty sockets for are for the SSI 263AP sound or speech generator chip or speech synthesis chip, which is completely unobtainium and impossible to get. Now, I am very lucky, and I don't know where it is right now, but I actually have a mocking board that I found in a box of junk. Not, not here, but I was at like this e-waste place and um, they had some stuff that they were just getting rid of in their warehouse and they're like, oh, you can look through. And I was just like digging through a box of junk and there was a mocking board and it had the speech chip installed on it. It was just loose, literally at the bottom of a box and there was a bunch of garbage in that box as well. And I thought, oh, I recognize this and I grabbed it. Now, I haven't tested that card and I, I don't have it handy. Well, it's, it's in my box full of Apple II stuff, so I won't grab it right now. Now, what I need to do is get that card out maybe for a future video and we can listen to that speech synthesis and uh, put that chip on this card. Now, it's actually interesting. I don't even know why would there be room for two speech chips? Why would you need two ever? Like dueling banjos of speech chips? If anyone has any idea why there'd be two, let me know. But as far as I'm aware, no software uses both. Now, when it comes to software that can use this card, there's a number of games that do, but it's not that many. And the funny thing is, I've never actually heard a Mockingboard work. I mean, I've heard videos of it working, but I've never heard it myself. So, so I am looking forward to actually getting all the right games that can use the Mockingboard and trying it out because Apple II's generally are just stuck with beeps and bloops like a beep speaker. And the beep speaker in the Apple II requires 100% CPU intervention. So it's very difficult for the Apple II to even make a beep while something else is happening. This is unlike the IBM PC, which uses one of its timer ICs to create the beep speaker. So that's why PC games have plenty of beep music, beep speaker music, while stuff is going on because it doesn't take any CPU power to do it. That's in contrast to the Apple II because the Apple II is just a very, very simplistic machine. One thing that is interesting about this card, and people will have to tell me if this is the case, but these 6522s have built-in timers. The Apple II has no timer built in. It has no way to really keep track of how much time has passed. It has to rely on CPU cycles, like counting cycles. And the issue is if you have a machine that's faster than the stock speed, like a 2GS or the Laser 128 or even whatever with an accelerator, that throws all that timer stuff way out of whack. So much so, the Apple II desktop environment, which is a like graphical environment for the Apple IIc and the IIe, and it works on the 2GS as well. You know, it gives you a desktop and you can double click on disks and move files around and stuff like that. If you run it at a faster speed, the double click doesn't work anymore because it's counting cycles for how long, you know, the time is between your clicks. And on my Laser 128 EX, which runs at like four megahertz or whatever it is, you can't double click on anything because it's too slow. Like it thinks, you know, this time between your two clicks is far longer than it actually is. Now, if it had access to these, these ICs on here on this mocking board, it could use the internal timer which uh, now that I think about it, I don't even know where these get their clock from. I don't see it as a crystal on this board. So it's coming from the motherboard. So as long as the clock on the motherboard is still running at the stock speed, and it's not sped up along with the CPU, then these should keep accurate time. And that could allow things like double click to work or clocks in games or whatever. Commodore 64 uses 6526s, which is like an evolution of this chip. And each one of those chips on the 64, it allows the 64 to keep accurate time once you set the time manually, it can actually keep the time in the chips itself in hardware, and the CPU doesn't need to occupy itself keeping the time. Although, that is something the Commodore can do as well because it's got the V-Sync interval and stuff like that, things that the Apple II doesn't have. Anyhow, this is a cool card, and uh, with the speech chip, I think it's potentially even cooler. So these will have to go into a future video where I can uh, test them out. Okay, so the last thing is the, there, <laughs> wow, okay, that's very cool. That's a sticker right here. Try to get the glare off of this. Visit Calc 3.3 for the 2E does not use the numeric keypad space key function to change cursor direction from horizontal to vertical. Therefore, you cannot move the cursor up and down from the keypad, only left and right. Previous versions of Visit Calc do support the space key function. Interesting that Apple themselves put that sticker on there. So, wow, take a look at this thing. It has the styling of the Apple II itself. There is the uh, keyboard header adapter that is included. So um, I'm assuming originally there would have been something that would screw in the back. Actually, no, this should be able to screw into the back 
of the Apple IIe because it has a little punch out for these types of connectors. And then you plug your numeric keypad into this so you can just quickly unplug and replug from the machine. So looking at this, the layout's a little unusual compared to what we're used to now, but we have the normal uh, numeric keypad, which is in a similar layout to what we're used to on modern keyboards. The zero key here is normally a wider key. And then on modern keyboards, of course, we have just a period. And this has a comma as well. And the number key or the zero key is therefore moved over. There's a space key, a left and a right key, escape. Interesting that escape would be on there. We have a return key, a print key, which I have no idea what a print key could possibly do. Plus, minus, multiply, division, and then we have uh, parentheses as well. A division key. I'm assuming you hit that key and you get a slash because there's no division key on any keyboard I'm aware of. Now, the feel of this keyboard is, uh, well, it's not too bad, actually. Let's take a look at the bottom here. Numeric keypad 2E, A2M 2003. Serial number 26,940. The condition is absolutely pristine. Wow, that is just really cool. Looks really, really nice. Well, thanks very much, Jeff, for including this cable as well. It's really cool. Um, I see this little piece of cardboard here probably had... Oh, I got it. Okay, cool. So um, there are little nuts and stuff. That would be for attaching this to the back of your machine. I'm just going to put the washers and these nuts on here just to kind of hold this together so I don't lose these because I could see myself losing these. I intend to build myself like a, I don't know, a kick-ass Apple IIe. I have a good number of IIe machines now, but I want to build one that's sort of like my go-to IIe that's like fully outfitted with all the various cards and stuff like that. And I definitely will be putting this header on there so when I have that thing set up on display, it can be fully outfitted, like with a mouse. I have a mouse interface card that will go in there. The extended keypad as well. Uh, accelerator, you know, the, the mocking board, all that stuff in there. It'll be awesome. Okay, let me grab an Apple IIe and we can just test out this external keypad. Alrighty, here's an Apple IIe. I just grabbed it. This one's untested. This was given to me by a local viewer in town here. Uh, the one thing that's interesting about this machine that I hadn't seen before, it has an Alps SKCC keyboard on it. And so... For sure, this is going to be my keeper keyboard because it um, feels absolutely amazing to type on. I don't know if it actually works. Maybe there's bad switches on there, but if it does have them, I should be able to fix them. Only thing it needs is some RetroBrite on the space bar, but luckily we're going into summer, <laughs> so that shouldn't be a problem. In fact, the weather in Portland right now is super hot. Uh, here in the U.S., uh, people used to Fahrenheit. It's like 94 degrees here. It was yesterday. I think it's going to be that again today, and that's, what, like 35 degrees Celsius? And for May, that's kind of unusually hot. <laughs> now, inside the machine here, as I said, it's untested. We have a normal disk to interface card. There's actually a super serial card. And then there's this uh, weird parallel card, which has the cable hanging off the back. It says MPC Peripherals Corporation Apple II Parallel Interface Card. So super simple for the 2, 2 Plus, and the 2E. I think I'm just gonna remove this because we don't need that in the machine. Just thread that through the back. Uh, the inside of this computer is quite dirty. Let's see about this. We got Apple II. Wow, that's stuck in there. Come on out of there. There we go. Wow. Looks like we have a third party 80 column slash 64K RAM expansion. So the 64K of RAM and then these two ICs that do some decoding. Not sure why it was so stuck in there. The Connector on the motherboard seems okay, and this seems okay. I don't know what the deal is with this little wire-wrapped jumper here is, but okay. Uh, now, one thing I'm going to have to do is I'm going to take this power supply out of here. These always have reefers that blow, and I have no idea if this bl blew already. It doesn't smell like it. I don't smell the, the normal stench of the uh, blown reefa, but I have some spares that are, are working. I've already recapped or taken the reefas out, so I'll swap it out with that. Um, as far as the number keypad goes... As far as the number keypad goes, there's the connector right there. It's next to the keyboard connector. That is the one for the number keypad. Um, this uses a microcontroller. The Apple IIe uses a microcontroller to handle the keyboard input. Sort of took away a lot of the complexity on the keyboard encoder that was inside of the Apple II and II Plus. So I don't know if like some different scan codes, it doesn't use scan codes, but you know, some different symbols are sent when you push on like the division key or whatnot. Anyhow, this is on there. And that's why I said maybe third-party keypads existed. 
After straightening out the pins a little bit, that connected right up. And then what you would do normally, like I said, is you would take this expansion connector here, which appears to be like a DB15 maybe, and the back of the machine has these little punch outs here. And I think there might be one or two or something that could accept a DB15. And actually looking at all the ones on here, that is a negative. There are none that support the uh, 15 pin. There's a bunch here that support the floppy drives, these ones, which I think is a 19 pin. And then we have lots of 25 pins, and then these are all nine pins. So my thought is that Apple, maybe when they included the original cable, had a little spacer, like a metal spacer on here that actually had room for another little screw on a little tab here. So you could slot it in, screw that screw in, and then you could tighten this nut in there and get it into place. That is my assumption. If you are familiar and you've seen one of the actual cables, I definitely put a comment down below. I'll be curious about that. Maybe that's something I could 3D print. A DB15 to DB19 adapter plate, something? I don't know. If you have any ideas, definitely let me know. All right, for the power supply, I'll just unplug the uh, original one here. And we'll grab another one here that I've already done my magic on, which is just the X2 cap replacement. I'm just gonna plug the power supply that I know works into the motherboard there. I'll leave the other one unplugged. We'll set that right on the top. Alrighty, RetroTink is connected. The power is connected. Everything is good to go. Let's turn this on. I don't have the number keypad connected quite yet. Oh, okay. I think this is working. Oh yeah. Okay, cool. So I think this is an unenhanced Apple IIe, which means if we push both Apple keys, control reset, it goes into this sort of fake diagnostic mode, which doesn't really do anything. It's not like it's testing the hardware. I don't know. Does anyone know what this even does, to be honest, other than this? Plays a kind of noise out of the speaker and, oh, kernel okay, okay. Does something, but I don't think this really does like a full on test. It's not like the later ROMs, which really do test the RAM and stuff like that. But the machine appears to be working normally, which is awesome. For booting up the computer, first we'll turn it off. I'm gonna use this floppy emu. I do need to remove the cable there from this adapter. I'm always scared to plug the floppy emu into the disc controller card. So on the Apple disc controller card here, we have a one right there. It's one of the same on that connector. And we have the ribbon cable on the floppy emu cable. So I think you kind of got to squeeze it on like this. And it does kind of go in at an offset like that because it does squish the cable on. But that is just par for the course as far as I'm aware. So let's hope that that is the right way that this goes on. And that is not the end of the floppy emu. There we go. It fired up. Okay, good. Whew. I'm always concerned, honestly. Alrighty, so it's booting up into something here. Oh, this is the uh, config utility for the Apple II VGA card, because that was the last thing I was using, obviously. That is not installed in here. Alrighty, with the machine off and the camera tilted sideways, I'm gonna plug the numeric keypad in. I'm just gonna connect this up and we'll let it hang out of the back of the case, like so. And let's power this on. Computer is working. And what I did is I have the Apple Works disc in the floppy emu here. So let's let this boot up. Uh, you can definitely tell, um, unfortunately, let me get the computer into the field of view a bit better. There is quite a lot of yellowing on this particular Apple IIe compared to this. This thing looks awesome. Now the keyboard, and I wish I could show this better. I'm just gonna move the camera here a little bit. So the keyboard on the Apple IIe, it's PBT, the keycaps. So they don't yellow, but the space bar it does yellow, it's ABS plastic. So that's why that looks a little yellow, but the rest of these look good. And the uh, color of the keycaps themselves matches. It's sort of an interesting brown color, but that was Apple at that point. But I think this is the color of what the 2E should look like, uh, not the color of this particular case here. All right, so let's see here. Uh, insert the next disc, Apple Works program or boot? We want the program disc. Why don't we hit enter on the number keypad here? Oh, I think that worked. That actually did work, very cool. Oh, it wants us to put the date in. Okay, whatever, 1992, sure. I don't know where you're getting that date from, somewhere at least. All right, there it is. So like I said, there's a left and right error on here, which is the same as what's on the keyboard, but there is no up and down on the number keypad. So why don't we go and start a new file? All right, so I am in the word processor here, which I know is not the ideal use for this. This would definitely uh, be for like spreadsheets and stuff like that. So let's see, this is a test. Honestly, I haven't ever typed on this keyboard other than just while the machine was off. It feels so nice to type on. Most 2Es have an okay typing feel, but they're just a little 
mushy, shall I say. Uh, the quick brown fox jumps over the lazy dog. That feels really nice. And uh, as far as I'm aware, all the keys are working. This thing will need a little bit of a clean. Looks like there's a bit of dirt underneath the keyboard, but this Alps keyboard has that awesome ping going on to it and just feels really nice to type on. Now, the number keypad here, it does work. Doesn't feel as nice because this has not Alps key switches in it. But hey, all the keys are working so far. Arrow keys are working. Space key is working. That is cool. Uh, escape. That works. So we got to go back to our file. There it is. I push that. Okay, so there's a print key. And when I push print, it gives us a question mark. Now, I wonder if that's like the same as control P or something. Nope. I don't know what that is. But we're getting a question mark. Plus key. Multiplication key, which is the asterisk. Minus. And there's divide. And just like I thought, divide is the same as a slash. In fact, if I push shift and divide... Oh, shift and divide is still giving us uh, as a slash and not a question mark. I kind of thought that maybe that would be the case, but no, I'm holding down shift and all the number keys are still working as normal number keys. So this doesn't just push the same keys as like what's on the keyboard. This actually has some other input that is specific. There's the uh, parentheses. Yeah, so everything is working. Um, I thought there was an escape key. Oh, yes, there is. And we know that's there. Sweet. So yeah, it's a bit funny. There's no up and down arrow. That's probably that's probably something that got an omission on their part. I think that sticker inside the box said you needed to hit the space bar to switch between up and down and left and right using these arrow keys, according to uh, VisiCalc, the older versions. And it seems like the new version did away with that. Why don't we try this? Uh, let's do a spreadsheet in here. Spreadsheet test. Now I have to say, I used a lot of this program back in the day. When I was a kid, I used I used Apple Works a ton. And this was a productivity app that was pretty good. I don't really remember how to use the spreadsheet at all, but I definitely did use it sometimes. But I used the word processor a lot. And it was a really good and functional word processor. It was fast, it could move text around pretty well, it was good at scrolling. And I have to say, when I use word processors on other APIC computers that don't have 80 column display, they're not, great. The fact that they're so slow usually and you can't see a whole line of text and all that, it's just, it kind of sucks. So let's see how this works here. So one, two, one, two, one, two, return. So I don't even know how to move to the next field. Hitting return doesn't automatically do that. Left and right does, of course. But if we push space, no. So this thing doesn't even support up and down in Apple's own program. The space key just beeps at me. Wow. Print just makes a beep. Return. Now, a few interesting things. If you hold down the Apple key and you push left and right, you do get it, the, the selection box moving the entire width of the screen, and that is the same on both of these. But the Apple key is the same thing. It's pushing one of the joystick buttons, and the other Apple key, what does that do? That seems to move also similarly. And then if you push up and down, it moves an entire page at a time but there is no way to do that on the number keypad. So I suppose the number keypad is still useful if you're trying to enter in like lots of things. So you could be like, doot, doot. Yeah, and you just have to use two hands and have your, your finger on the down arrow key. And there you go. So this thing is definitely working well though, even though it has that somewhat limited functionality, it's still a cool peripheral and just not a very common one, I don't think. I wonder how many of these Apple actually sold. So anyhow, thank you very much, Jeff and Luke, for sending this in, along with these other cards, which are kind of buried under here. There it is, the serial card and the reactive micro mocking board replica. And also thank you very much for this chocolate Harry bow. I definitely think that is pretty awesome. And watch for a future video where I test out the reactive micro mocking board along with the other mocking board I have and this interesting super serial card. I kind of love these obscure Apple II peripheral cards, the ones that are actually useful, because there's ones out there that are like, you can't do much with them. But things like this that promise to be better than the regular Super Serial card and offer a built-in terminal program, that's pretty neat. I love stuff like that because it just allowed you to very easily use that thing and say you stuck it into an Apple II Plus, you could get online, with a modem that is, really simply without even needing to have a floppy disk drive, because there was gonna be people out there who had two pluses without disk drives and putting that card in them could actually get them online. Pretty neat. 
So that is going to be it for this mail call episode. I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, thumbs up. Thanks very much for everyone who sent stuff in. I really appreciate all the donations. It's just pretty heartwarming and amazing. Uh, the viewers are still donating so much stuff to me. There's still a relatively large pile of stuff back there that I need to get to. Uh, so um, watch for that in future episodes. I try not to overwhelm the second channel with only mail call episodes, uh, mix in some other random junk and stuff, because I just have a lot, have a lot of stuff to make videos about it. And it's I could keep doing it forever, which is a good thing, right? It's a good problem to have. So anyhow, thanks very much again. And uh, thanks to my patrons. Their names are scrolling up the side of the screen. They get early access to videos behind the scenes, things like that. And I guess that's going to be that. So stay healthy, stay safe. I will see you next time. Bye-bye.